Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now today we're on location in England, Tamworth in Staffordshire, where they have a castle right in the town centre. What makes this castle quite rare? It's not a ruin. This castle has survived a thousand years of history and is still intact. So before we go into the castle, I've got to mention that the castle sits at the confluence, as it called, of two rivers, the Anchor and the Tame. And the Saxons, 700s, actually built two water mills here. And they found archaeological evidence of them, which makes them amongst the earliest water mills actually found in England. Now, the Saxons had a royal residence here. They used to spend uh, Easter and Christmas. So it was quite an important place for the Saxons, a royal residence. But 874 AD, the Vikings used these very same rivers to row down, attack the town and sack it. This places Tamworth in a dangerous position because now they're on the borders of Mercia and the Daneland. To the north of here, the Danes ruled. This was quite a difficult period, but we have a woman, the daughter of Alfred the Great, Ethelflaed. She refortified this area, turned it into a burr. That's a fortified town, ditches and all of that. So Tamworth was secured for the Saxons. In fact, it was so secure that uh, Mercia merged with Wessex, making it one of the most powerful Saxon kingdoms. I love this, this is ancient history. However, something happened, some tiny little trivial thing in 1066. Oh yeah, the Norman conquest of Britain. Now we can go and have a look at the castle because it's those who raised a mott and bailey here. Now, when you look at these Norman mott and baileys, the mott, the hill, of course they're man-made, but they're not made by the Normans, they supervised. This one at Tamworth was raised, this mott, 1073. It's over 14 meters high. It's made with layers of stone, compacted earth, and the locals, by point of sword, were made to raise these motts. Some of them, I've read, only took around two weeks to actually build because they got everybody involved. And it's amazing to think they've built the mott, they've put a wooden castle on top, but a hundred years later, they actually replace it with a stone shell keep. It took 10 years to build. It's 10 meters high, over two meters thick. And for 800 years, the castle has grown around that stone shell keep, all built on top of that mott. What we have here is a stone causeway and I think it is absolutely fantastic. This is a cross section of stonework from the Norman period. But once they are replacing the wooden fortress with the stone, they needed a better access. So what they've done is they built this stone causeway. Just look at this herringbone pattern here, how intricate it actually is. The reason it's got the herringbone is quite fascinating. This is because of subsidence. It can take the weight and it can take anything giving underneath the stone causeway. And testimony to that, here it is, 800 years later. To me, that is absolutely wow. So now it's time to have a look inside the castle. Let's make our way across this causeway. Let's get inside, see what's waiting for us. So here we are in the courtyard of the castle and you can actually see the difference in the architecture. Medieval and then coming across this range that spreads all the way around, it looks a little bit Tudor to me and then behind us there is some definite medieval. In fact, it's the dungeon. It's interesting what you find just before we go into the dungeon. Have a look up there. So was that once a fireplace? If it was, that means there must have been some form of building above us. These places are amazing. You've got to keep your eyes open. Just the tiniest little bit of evidence there was something else there. And it does, in fact, look like a chimney. And further up, another one. So perhaps we were inside a wooden fronted building. Now let's go and have a look in the dungeon. Do you know, everybody thinks the dungeon is the place of prison or torture. In fact, dungeon comes from donjon, and it means stone tower. How about that for a bit of knowledge? This is brilliant because it is a real dungeon, donjon, mind the step. 
This is the base of the Norman Tower. Right now, this tower, I do know part of it was destroyed on the orders of King John in the Barons' War because the family had changed sides. This base could be for storage or it could be for refuge during the harsh times, for instance, of the Civil War, 1640s, when they had cannons. So refuge in here. This is the solid part of the castle. And to have an original dungeon, donjon, it's absolutely brilliant. So let's explore a little bit more of the castle. Just before I go though, a willow bound barrel. This is before they had iron bound barrels. This is quite rare. This is well worth a look. We're going up inside the battlements, the curtain wall to an actual arrow slit. Perfect. So what's happened here is this was a full arrow slit, right? And it's been filled in, probably around the time of the Civil War, into a complete musket loop. So now I've got a view going right over the river. Even a small cannon could fire out of here and the enemy will have a hard job getting any shot back. So this shows you how the castle, in fact, these are Tudor bricks. So yeah, this has been altered, Civil War, for firearms. The hidden treasures that you find in these places, it amazes me. And interestingly, you have an arrow slit, just about big enough for a crossbowman to get into, covering the main door to the Great Hall. Bang. So here we are in the Great Hall. Now I've got to tell you, this late medieval, early Tudor hall holds a special place in my heart. One of my earliest memories of a castle is here at Tamworth, coming into this Great Hall with my dad. I must have been around five or six years of age and I was blown away. It has a fantastic fireplace, absolutely fantastic. The bricks behind it though tell a story because some of them are late medieval early tudor and then some are later as the fireplace has been repaired but you imagine coming into this place for a banquet for a meal and the fire is blazing away or on a sunny day with the sun shining through these windows these windows by the way are nothing more than a symbol of the wealth of this castle but there is a nice little window to the back of the hall and if you look up you can see it you open those windows, put the minstrels behind it, and they will play. Now, I seem to remember that they were fully open when I, when I first came here as a kid, and I was told that this was the minstrel gallery. I'm not sure now, but most importantly about this hall, it's the roof. It is a tie beam roof, and it's nine meters wide, which is incredible. And what a tie beam is, when you have the rafters, they come together at a point, but then you have a vertical beam joining them to the horizontal beam, tying everything in, the tie beam. Also, this room itself is over eight meters high. It makes it one of the biggest or the greatest, if you like, great halls we have here in England. But there is a sinister side to it. If you come with me to the back of the great hall, here we have all of this lovely oak paneling with a collection of swords and armor there's some firearms down there raging through the centuries but there is one particular sword here it is it's a serving sword it's for beheading remember Anne Boleyn this is the kind of sword that would have been used to take off her head this particular one belonged to Franco Sebastian Solaris a Spanish executioner and it has been said that this sword has been used to take off the heads of many many people and interestingly it's said that this sword is haunted by the souls of those people it has taken. We're in the Tudor part of the castle now, and uh, it's been altered, it's been changed quite a lot. However, we have the dining hall and a parlour, so let's pop in and have a look. Come and have a look at this wall. This is fantastic. Typical Tudor construction. This is lovely. 
You know, in England you often see the Dells that join all of this together and they're always proud. And the reason being is the beams shrink and the Dells stay their size because they're cut through. You can see where alterations have been made uh, looking at this carving here. This is, is quite possibly Stuart. Just shows you the grandeur. And if you come over here, this must have been a doorway at one time, but has been filled in. And it shows you the inside of what's called lath and plaster. How they used to make a smooth wall. That's on the inside. This will be plaster. That's what it's like on the inside. And some of the furniture in here. Yeah, a writing desk. We look at the glasswork on there and the jug. The table is a buffet, a buffet, and an armchair. But I do know that those armchairs, sometimes the lid lifted up and you could sit and have a poop. <laughs> so we're going from a parlor, what they call the day parlor, where the family would spend time together. And we're gonna go into the dining room, mainly for the family to eat, but also for entertainment. But it's decked out for a school group that's visiting. So there's lots of artifacts out. So let's have a look. It's interesting when you look at the, the Tudor period, because that's what we're looking at here. Henry VIII, for instance, the great glutton. Uh, it's just an interesting aside that uh, he suffered from constipation because he ate meat, pies, pasties, gorged on that kind of food. Apparently he didn't uh, consume that much fruit or vegetables. So he had a bit of a problem. One of the things they loved was pies. And we have the old nursery rhyme, four and 20 blackbirds baked in the pie. And when the pie was open, the birds began to sing. What is that? Wasn't that a dainty dish to set before the king? Well, it's two pies. You got the pie with the meat in underneath and then a pie on the top, which has got live blackbirds. They open it, the birds all pop out. Hey, isn't that lovely? It's the whole, the whole business of showing off with food. In the Elizabethan age, the Tudor, the later Tudor age, they were absolutely marvelous at it. However, one slight problem, if you're at a Tudor banquet, most of the food you eat will be warm, not piping hot, because it had been paraded around. Now, this is an interesting one. This is what they call an antechamber, but it's part of the kitchen. The kitchen was accessed through here, could have been downstairs. And up here they bought for the final stage of the food as it's been sent through. You have a swan over yonder that's been prepared, a royal feast. Now, I used to think when I was a kid and I'd seen these kind of things, that they put all the feathers back in, but they didn't. This is how they did it. They skinned it. All the feathers are off, salt the inside of the skin, cook the bird, then you pin it all back together. Here he is, this wonderful beast. Smoked eels, animals hanging so the maggots will eat all the way through and then drop out so they're actually gamey meat. And then here, this is good stuff. I haven't seen one of these for years. This is actually to keep food away from the mice and the rats. So your cheese might be up in there. Yeah, this is quite an interesting place. And this will be kept under lock and key. This is the spice chest, very expensive. And of course, your willowed wine barrels down there. This is great, I love it. Fish from the local river, carp and that kind of thing. One of these, a suckling pig. Now I've cooked one of these and I cooked it in the old traditional way. And the whole outside of the pig was crackling. And it was in the army, I did it as a favor for a friend who needed a, a bit of a celebration. And I got the heel of the knife and just went along breaking the crackling. And the guys and the lasses, they were just pulling chunks of pork, but I'd stuffed the inside full of apples and potatoes and the whole thing was absolutely scrumptious. These wouldn't have had potatoes, although they came in the late Elizabethan period, they wouldn't have had potatoes the way we eat them now. There, of course, is all the cups and jugs. Great. 
just great. Now, I don't know if this is a salt tower or whether it's actually sugar, but I do know that sugar in those days was brown, not white. So I would say this, this is probably rock salt. Then you've got all the pestles and mortars to grind it down. So I think more than likely it's salt as opposed to sugar. And in this corner, I have to show you these because it's, it's, it's just honest. These are brooms from the day. They're not for flying on, they are actually for brushing the floor. And these were made by men who lived in the forest and their job was to make brooms. Simply that. The end of the 18th into the 19th century, the castle was inherited by the Townsend family, but it was dilapidated, a bit of a ruin. So they spent an absolute fortune modernizing the castle. Ta da! You have an iron fireplace there, so the great works. It's not the big roaring fireplace of the Tudor times. But they also changed the windows into the Georgian period style windows. They took out the Tudor Bay windows. They modernized the place just like you would modernize your own house at home. Around the world, people, they have houses, they put in double glazing. Well, hey, that's exactly what the Townsend family did. Well, they saved the castle. Unfortunately for them, though, it bankrupted one of them and the castle was sold to a, a London businessman, I understand. But the Townsend family later bought it back. And that opens up another leaf into the history of Tamworth Castle. I just thought I'd show you this because we're actually making our way up the stairs to the very top of the castle. Quick warning for Julie here as she holds the camera. Mind your head. Wow, look at this. Right at the very top of Tamworth. The amazing thing is about Tamworth Castle, it was here first. Then the town grew up around it and it continues to grow. So you've got Edith's church over there, that's 14th century. So it just shows that the town was getting more and more prosperous to have a nice church like that. So we're right at the top of the castle and it's decked out for the Stuart period, the 1600s. So they've now got servants living in the top of the castle. They don't just dust down in the Great Hall or anything like that. They have their own place to live. And what they've done is they've opened this all up and they've made a simple bed. And what I love about this is the way it has the rope that the mattresses actually sat on. Now these had to be wound tight. They actually tightened them with a stick all the way down and then fasten them at the end. And this is where in English we get a great old saying, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. So you sleep tight because you're on the tight rope. And the bed bugs, well, they speak for themselves. But it's great here at Tamworth because in this castle, they're showing you all of the different stages of the life of the castle, but also the different people who worked and lived in the castle. That's great. So just before we leave the servants' quarters, have a look at all this beamwork, right? This holding up this roof, but if you look underneath, you can just see my finger poking through there and possibly there. There were down beams, cross beams, lath and plaster there. This was a doorway. So this was two separate rooms, but in later history, it's been opened up into one chamber the servants' chambers. This room is wow. Turn of the 1600s, the Stuart period, your oak panelling and, and an incredible four-poster bed with all of the coat of arms, the carvings all over it. This is absolutely wow. I love this. It's an interesting reflection, the bolster on the bed. If you put pillows against it, it means that you can't lie full out. And that's one of the wealthy people would sleep kind of semi sitting up and they would often have a servant at the end of the bed. And that servant there on a little truckle bed was there because if the devil looked in through the window, 
he will claim the soul of the servant first. Oh my goodness me, the beliefs of history, hey? This is the picture of Mary, and it tells you the whole story that uh, she married uh, Sir Henry Gough in 1670, and by him had 10 sons and six daughters. She must have been exhausted. <laughs> you know, you don't see these very often. It's an old wardrobe, all hand carved. Now I've got a story about one of these, and it goes back to this period, exactly one of these pieces of uh, furniture when a man called John Churchill, who later became the Duke of Marlborough, who actually hid in one of these because he was having an affair with a lady who was married, but was also having an affair with Charles II. And Charles II came into the room finding that his lady or somebody else's lady wasn't expecting him, but somebody else. He heard the creak, so the legend goes, opened the wardrobe, and there is John Churchill, totally naked, except for his hat. So he doffs his hat, your majesty. Now, they've both been caught, the lady and the king. So John Churchill was rewarded, invested his money, obtained a commission. But that is a whole different story. It's just one tiny tale of a wardrobe from the Stuart period. You know, it's incredible, isn't it? You look at all this carving here. It's amazing, but this fireplace has been changed. It's been filled in and a Georgian fireplace put in its uh, stead. You imagine a blazing fire in here and officers during the English Civil War discussing what they're gonna do next because the Civil War breaks out in 1642 and this castle was held for the king, for Charles I. And it would have just stayed that way, really, because it was a minor place, wasn't that important. However, the garrison, the soldiers, used to sally forth out of the castle and attack parliamentarian wagon trains that were going to supply Lichfield for their siege of the cathedral. So this became a thorn in the side of parliament. They should have left it alone. So it was the 23rd of June, 1643, that the parliamentarian army paid attention to Tamworth Castle. Siege lasted two days. The garrison surrenders, this now becomes a parliamentarian castle. But in 1644, the Royalists try to take back Tamworth Castle from the parliamentarian forces. They had over 2,000, I think it was 2,200 troops for the siege of Tamworth Castle, but they failed. And that meant that the castle stayed in the hands of the parliamentarian army. So at the end of the Civil War, it was on the right side. It wasn't slighted. And you will find as you go round England, Wales, Scotland even, that many castles that stood for the king were slighted. They were pulled down or made indefensible by the parliamentarians. And that's the key thing. Come the end of the Civil War, this is in the hands of Parliament. It is actually on the right side to survive. So we've just come through a time warp. We've come off the medieval battlements into what was the Tudor range. There was another story above us, but that was knocked down when they, uh, the Townsend family spent literally a fortune refurbishing the castle. And now here we are in the 18th century, the late 1700s. This is their parlor. And it is a time warp. Swags and tails curtains. A clock, books. Staffordshire pottery over on the mantelpiece there. Updated fireplace. You know, it's not surprising that uh, all the renovations that were done on this castle bankrupted one of the, the Townshead families. It, it's sad. I think it was George on his death, he was found to be bankrupt. But they remortgaged and managed to get the castle back. So I understand that's how they did it. But they didn't live here. They rented it out and there was a, an elderly lady lived here with her footman and cook and a couple of servants. But later on, it was Thomas Cook, a wealthy widower, who rented the castle. Now, Thomas Cook was important because he was a textile manufacturer. He employed 500 people in Tamworth, so he was a very, very important man. But the Townsend family, towards the end of the 19th century, 
sold the castle and it was purchased by Tamworth Council and turned into a museum. That's how come Tamworth Castle survived. Built by the Normans, survives the Baron Wars there, survives the Civil War, it's not slighted because it was on the right side, and then various families held on to it, made it better, until eventually it now belongs literally to the people of Tamworth. And to me, that is just fantastic. Well, I hope you enjoyed our video, our little tour around Tamworth Castle, the complete Tamworth Castle, well worth a visit. Well, if you liked it, then of course, like, share and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on the all notification button so you know what's coming down the line from the History Squad. But before I go, quick mention to a couple of our Patreon members, Jeffrey Hollowell and Steve Valley. Hey guys, thanks a million. Without your help, I wouldn't be able to do these films. Bye for now.